Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar on key considerations for the transition from broker to banker. I'm joined here today with our friends from Independent Financial, and I'm Kim Dittmer from Richie May. Uh, we'll give you a little bit of background about Richie May, and then I'll go ahead and introduce uh, the independent financial team to go ahead and kick off the presentation. So background on Richie May, we were founded over 35 years ago with a dedicated focus on the mortgage banking industry. We offer a full suite of services designed for mortgage banking from advisory services to some deep expertise in the audit and tax groups as well. Also just wanted to cover a few housekeeping items for you. Uh, this broadcast is being recorded. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and we will uh, send out the webinar recording to everyone who's registered for this presentation within one to two business days. And there will also be a quick survey after the webinar. So we'd appreciate if you take some time and, and fill that out. Now, moving on to today's presenters, as I said, I'm Kim Dittmer. I run the, the client accounting and advisory services practice here at Richie May. And I'd like to introduce Jim Harrison. VP and Portfolio Manager at Independent Financial, as well as Dre Roberts, SVP and National Sales Manager. So thanks, Jim and Dre, for joining us, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Um, obviously, today we're going to talk about kind of a success, uh, successful relationship between a warehouse lender and um, a, a seller. Uh, my name is Dre Roberts. I work for Independent Financial. Independent Financial is a roughly $17 billion bank based in McKinney, Texas. <clears throat> we are publicly traded under the stock symbol IBTX um, and very highly regarded, five-star Bauer rated bank. Uh, very lucky to be a part of this, this company. So we have our first poll question. Should see that. Just very quickly, <clears throat> this presentation, you know, it's uh, it doesn't necessarily represent the views or values of independent uh, independent financial, um, the bank, um, or its parent, independent the warehouse lending division or its parent, independent financial. Um, our presentation is kind of based on best practices that we've learned uh, in three decades of working experience between myself and Jim Harrison, working for multiple warehouse lenders. Uh, as we talk about this, obviously we're gonna talk about not just what we can provide, but what other warehouse lenders can provide. And so we're, we will reference what we, uh, what's common for us, but not necessarily, that doesn't necessarily mean everybody else is gonna have the exact st same uh, time, standards, et cetera. So what to think about when you're making the transition? <clears throat> Need to think about state licensing. Um, every state is different. Uh, so there's, uh, you know, some states have very different guidelines, such as Pennsylvania that has different licensing for different ways of selling loans if you're a broker or correspondent or you're servicing. So it's important to understand the guidelines of the states that you may be um, acting as a lender in versus a broker. <clears throat> uh, it's important to research a, a, a banker's bond. This is a, uh, in a couple of insurance policies that you will be required to purchase and maintain um, the E&O policy is basically an insurance policy against um, the loss of collateral. So hypothetically, if you had a customer that you closed a loan with, funded it, it's sitting on the warehouse line and somehow the, the coverage wasn't bound or they had the right, wrong type of coverage in the storm or flood or whatever came and took that, that E&O policy would give you some level of coverage on that. <clears throat> Um, it's very, it's it's pretty intricate, so it's a good idea to have a conversation with an experienced insurance agent that understands those different types of insurance, this specific type of insurance. You'll also be asked to have a fidelity bond. Uh, this fidelity bond is an insurance policy that basically protects you against employee wrongdoing. So if you had an employee that uh, decided to have money wired to a different account other than yours or ours, um, then, and it was a criminal act, then you would have the ability to file a claim on that. The nice thing about this insurance is, is these agents typically will write it to include other parties beyond just you as, beyond just your employees, but people that you employ to do services such as title agents or 
other third parties. Um, you will have to get registered as a, with MERS so that you can issue your own MIN number. Um, as you can see in the screen, it takes four to six weeks. Uh, it's a four to six week process. So once you make the decision, this is something you probably want to start kind of early in the process. <laughs> the um, the uh, you, you know applying for a warehouse line typically takes you know between two to six weeks. It can take longer if it's a more sophisticated um, scenario. Um, for us, it takes about two to four weeks, depending on how quickly we get the how complete the application is and how how, how we you know we just how complicated the scenario is either way um, we can get this moving pretty quickly on your timeline um, but it is good to check if you're applying with another warehouse letter how long that takes um, you want to get with the investor um, and find out what their nuances are um, if they're if getting approved with them as a correspondent is uh, contingent on having a warehouse line very similar to a state licensing. Um, you want to make sure that you know there's not a there is or isn't a contingency there. If there is, it's a good idea to go ahead and start the warehouse process with us. Um, it is a good idea to start researching companies like fulfillment companies, third parties that will help you uh, close, ship, and fund your loans, and also provide other services. Um, it's it's a good idea as you grow, have multiple takeout investors, and multiple warehouse lines, multiple sources of funding. It's also a good idea to talk about budgeting and, and your your bookkeeping, accounting, and that's an area Richie May can help you with. So what changes would you expect operationally? <laughs> um, basically, you're going to be creating a secondary market transaction versus kind of a direct, just a direct uh, table funded loan. Um, synonyms for the emerging correspondent or mini core, they're all basically the same thing, but non-delegated correspondent, emerging correspondent, mini correspondent. It's important to understand your cash flow. That's going to change because where you're used to getting paid at the table as a broker um, or shortly after that, uh, you have to wait till your loan is sold before you would uh, be able to collect the premium on that loan. It's a good idea to set clear expectations with your MLOs, but because it, it's going to change the way they're compensated as well. Um, other things to consider is you're going to have more control of the loan process. You're going to be able to do the disclosure yourself, um, your, your initial disclosure. You can also outsource that. Um, you're going to be able to typically pick an appraisal, appraisal management company that probably is more local, understands your market, and um, not have to deal with an investor's kind of national conglomerate. It's a kind of a one size fits all model for everyone. Um, the nice thing is having that relationship directly with the appraisal management company will help you in that if there is an issue with the relationship, um, then you can go directly to them as the person that, um, as their vendor or as your vendor. Uh, change of circumstances, you will control those. You're not gonna have to wait for that. Um, your compensation plan, <laughs> you still have to have compensation plans, but those will be set up with your your originators directly versus a one-size-fits-all comp plan with your investor. Uh, closing, you will have more control of that. Um, instead of using just the investor as, as a, the closing agent, then or drawing the docs and closing shipping, funding, et cetera, you will ha have the choice to pick a third-party fulfillment company. Sometimes the investors provide it and they do a good job of it, but at least you have the flexibility of picking who's doing the best job. In essence, this turns this transaction more into an a la carte transaction versus it being a uh, kind of full meal deal or uh, you know ordering off the menu all courses at one time. <clears throat> what will change operationally? You know, we talk about possibly being able to make more money, but that's not the purpose of this, this program. <clears throat> what we want to see you do is be able to close more loans, and that's why you're going to make more money. Um, sometimes investors will pay you an additional eighth or quarter, quarter point. You're going to have to talk to them to negotiate with them. But again, where people make the transition and feel like it's been successful for them is because they're able to do more loans or be able, they're able to have more control of their destiny, and they're able to control you know, their public opinion in social media. That's a, something that can be very detrimental. And so when you are giving them the best possible service levels at every aspect of the loan, then that, that gives you that ability. 
Um, the way that the cash flow works is generally we you hear about a haircut on a warehouse line. So um, our advance rate is typically 99%, um, and you will fund 1%. Now we do net fund, which means all the fees that are payable to you on the HUD, or excuse me, on the uh, CD, uh, the, which, which changes um, because your uh, your underwriting fees, your um, your prepaids, just about everything is payable to you now. So whatever's payable to you and the borrower pays at closing counts towards that haircut. So you may have a 4% haircut on a loan um, because of the, all the fees the borrower is bringing in and, and not have to fund any of that. Now, if you were doing something along the lines of a, a refinance with no escrows and pay a lot of borrower credits, you may have a, 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 a haircut on that loan that you would have to fund. But haircuts are not always a bad thing. <laughs> As you can see in the example I have here, if you take a $375,000 loan and you fund 50% of that, that's 187,500, six and a half percent interest rate, and I'm just using a random interest rate. Um, that's $12,187 a year divided by the 365 equals um, the $33 and 39 cents per day. So if that dwells for 10 days, you know, that's 339 or $333 that you, $334 math is wrong on the screen, but um, as an example, another way of looking at this, if you took a certain amount of money, because we all have to have a certain amount of liquidity to keep our business running um, and, and approved with the different entities such as warehouse lines, but if you took a half million dollars and said, hey, I'm going to deploy that all year long at an average of a 6.5% 6 interest rate, that's an extra $32,500 in annual, uh, additional revenue. Um, another thing that we've seen, uh, it making that transition from broker to banker for all of the reasons that I've mentioned is much more attractive to loan officers. It helps you attract loan officers, um, including the more flexible comp plans. And I say more flexible comp plans. What I'm saying is if you had a loan officer that came in and said, hey, I want to be more aggressive and I want to only make 75 basis points, but do more loans, they would have that. And then the next loan officer could, you, know, you may have three choices of different comp plans. It's always important, though, to check with some a compliance attorney to make sure that your comp plans are compliant. Cash flow changes, we talked about this before. Again, loans typically take three to ten, ten days to get purchased on the emerging correspondent channel. Um, but you, you want to have that conversation with loan officers to make sure they're aware of it as a chance, you know, because that is going to be a change, potentially a change to how they get paid. Um, you, you need to be aware of the covenants that we're going to set as a warehouse lender. Warehouse lenders are going to set a liquidity covenant, a tangible net worth covenant, leverage covenant, profitability co covenant. You know, in a profitability covenant, this is kind of the easiest one. We want to see you make a dollar. We want to see you not lose money. Um, a leverage covenant is just the, the amount of money we'll lend you relative to what you have, what your tangible net worth is. So, if you have hypothetically $200,000 net worth in the company and you got a 20 times leverage ratio, you'd be potentially uh, eligible for a, a $4 million line. And then of course, liquidity is just the amount of liquidity we want to see in that tangible net worth. <clears throat> One of the things that almost all warehouse lenders require is a personal guarantee. So we will require anyone that has greater than 10% ownership in the company to sign a personal guarantee. One thing that scares people because um, they think, hey, I don't want to guarantee this loan into perpetuity. The reality is you're guaranteeing the money from the time it leaves the warehouse line to the time it comes back. So three to 10 days um, is what you're guaranteeing on that loan, um, on every loan you fund. But it's not, there's not a crawl back through the warehouse line. So the investor, if they said, hey, we found fraud on this loan, we want you to buy it back so your customer buys it back, that doesn't happen. It doesn't work that way. So one of the things that we always see is when people make the transition from broker to banker, it changes the, their mentality. They know they have these covenants they have to maintain. And so they keep, they do a better job of managing their pipeline, budgeting, and keep, you know, retaining earnings, things of that nature. Start thinking about um, it, it, when you make the transition, you may not have the resources on site to do some of the things that you need. So, you know, talk to a company like Richie May where they have outsourced bookkeeping, uh, CFO functions, you know, just, you know, crawl, walk, run. You don't have to employ all these people from day one. You just need to find trusted partners that know what they're doing 
it, it will help you get from one, one step to the next. Also, this is important to me, and it's particularly important right now based on what's going on in the market. Understand the cyclicality of the industry and understand about variabilizing as many of your costs as you can, because if you create a large staff during the middle of a refi boom, you know, we all know the story, uh, as, as the volume dwells, dwindles, you've got to start cut making cuts. And um, it's good to understand where you've, you know, what, what the market conditions can, can do, change, you know, change from being very, very good to not so good, and what's your plan for that? Also, I always encourage to consider a fulfillment partner. This is, again, a third party company that will draw, you know, draw your dot, ship, fund, your loans versus, you know, necessarily having a, a super robust closing department. You know, you can have a closing department, but you can have overflow with a third party fulfillment company. One thing I would be very remiss in is not talking about the risks. Um, this is not a complete list of risks, but these are the most common. You know, when, when you put a loan on your warehouse line, you always have to understand that loan may be unsellable. Um, the investor looks at it and they don't want to buy it. Now, in a tip traditional warehouse relationship, that would be with a, you know, that, that the originator, originating company would have underwritten that loan. So there's a potential for underwriting defects. The nice thing is as a uh, emerging correspondent, that's all but eliminated, not totally, but all but eliminated because the investor underwrites the loan. Closing defects. So a close, your loan is going to close. And again, this is where it's important with these third party fulfillment relationships. If you have that, understand what their reps and warrants are, what responsibilities they're willing to take. But if there is a closing defect after the underwrite, it's, it's important to understand that um, the investor may not purchase that. Dealing with one right now that somebody did use the wrong um, caps on an arm loan. And so, you know, we've got to make some changes there. And then, of course, fraud. If fraud is found, the investor didn't pick up fraud or during the underwrite, but they pick it up prior to the uh, the um, purchase of the loan, then, you know, there's potential they wouldn't purchase that loan. There's the high likelihood they wouldn't purchase that loan. Uh, but we, you know, as we we can talk through all of this stuff as we, you know, as we go through an application process. So um, there's interest rate risks. If your investor uh, didn't buy the loan quickly, rate shifted, your lock expired, there's the potential for you to have to take a loss on that. And that's where it's good to understand the nuances of the investor because the investor, if you know they're purchasing the loan in three to five days every time, you can kind of budget for that with your lock. Um, obviously, covenants, um, we check covenants quarterly. And if you don't meet your covenants, you know, we, we there's a potential that we could uh, waive the, um, the violation, but you know, we, we would definitely want to talk to you. And, and if they got seriously out of whack, then we could potentially, um, you know, suspend the line or terminate the relationship. Uh, control of collateral, essentially, this is where a, a note does not get shipped to the right place. We ask the, at cl the closing instructions, ask, we ask that the note get shipped to us to our, uh, to, to, so that we can endorse it and protect our, perfect our interest in the loan but if that was shipped to you or lost or something like that then you would we would need to uh you know take take measures to correct that the the final thing i'll say on that is if there is an issue please try and make us your first phone call we've dealt with these issues and we can hopefully direct you to resolve them as quickly as possible i will emphasize in the emerging course this kind of sounds scary in the emergence emerging correspondence space the frequency of this is very low, um, but that is generally because people take make smart decisions not to put loans on the line they shouldn't, and uh, give themselves the proper amount of time to get it purchased, etc. So, poll question number two. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Jim Harrison. Awesome. Thank you, Dre. 
So uh, just to start out, we're, we threw a lot of information out there for you guys. Um, I would recommend, um, you're not going to understand it all in one shot. I'd recommend grabbing a, one or two nuggets out there. Um, it's a lot to take in, and we can always revisit on, on a subsequent call. Um, the goal of my slides is I wanted to be able to create something from the eyes of the warehouse lender, what what they look at, what they typically look at. Again, warehouse lenders typically operate the same, but some of them have major differences. Um, but um, I'll, I'll go through those with, the, uh, with these slides. So as a broker, you probably think of, of your net worth in the company um, in yourself like an all-in-one approach. Our goal as the warehouse lender is to disaggregate the company, the mortgage, the mortgage entity, um, isolate that, and 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 do our financial analysis on the mortgage company themselves. Um, that's I mean the mortgage company is going to be the obligor. That's where the loan is going. Uh, the personal uh, net worth is good as far as, as as far as guarantor support, and certainly could be a source of additional paid in capital in the future. But our main focus is just to um, isolate that mortgage company. Um, all financial statements are important. Um, it's my opinion that the balance sheet is is one of the most important. Um, it's that snapshot in time, and that's the one that's used to call off after the warehouse line, like Trey was saying, the 15 to 20 times leverage of your tangible net worth. So um, there are some assets that a a warehouse lender will not leverage against, or or in other words, will deduct or adjust tangible net adjust net, net worth to be tangible net worth. Uh, these include shareholder receivables, uh, affiliate receivables, advanced members, intangibles. So if you think about it, you have your assets minus your liabilities is your equity minus unacceptable assets is your tangible or adjusted debt worth. Then we'll times that by 20, 15 or 20 to get that. So again, just I want you to be, uh, know that not all assets are acceptable. Sure, you want to hit the next slide? Thank you. The warehouse lender, uh, they want to see good, re good financial reporting. So what we do is when we get a, a new application, um, the meat of the package is going to be on the financial analysis. And what we do is we take three three periods of time. Um, right now, since you know it's past year end, we're having you know uh, the last consecutive fiscal year end, so we have three periods. We're going to spread them, and what that means is we're just going to put them side by side and compare them, and we'll look at the increases and decreases, and, and just find out um, the behavior or the mechanics of, of, of the company itself. So optics um, presentation is everything. So I, I see majority of the financial statements are done on uh, from uh, third parties, excuse me, such as uh, uh, QuickBooks or, 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 or um, accounting for mortgage bankers. We have some folks prepare themselves on 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 spreadsheets. It's okay if you, as the owner, it's okay if you don't know accounting, as long as somebody on your staff knows that, or at the very at the very least, you know, a third party, uh, Richie May again provides these types of services. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of difference. There's gonna be a lot of differences when you transition, and. The variable model is good because it keeps you focused on what you do best, and that's originate loans. Um, as time progresses, could you take that back in house? Sure. Um, and we have many customers with very large lines in the NDC channel that choose to keep everything variable. Um, so, some other things to consider, um, if you haven't already, is uh, how much capital flows in and out of the company. And we'll have a, a subsequent slide on that. Uh, it's kind of pretty important. Um, Warehouse lenders get comfort by um, verifying liquidity. So this is old saying, trust but verify, right? So on, on your balance sheet, you'll have your cash. I'm um, just say it's 12, 31, 22. Um, you'll send the warehouse lender bank statements for the majority of the cash that you have on there, um, just to make sure they uh, they sync up. Or brokerage statements if you have multiple securities. Um, when transitioning over, there's going to be some differences on, on your balance sheet and income statement, but more importantly, the balance sheet, you're going to have an asset now, and it's, be called, it's going to be called loan sell for sale, mortgage loan sell for sale. It's just going to be the fair value of that asset, typically the, um, the actually loan, uh, loan amount of the note. There's also going to be a corresponding liability, and we'll call that warehouse line of credit or WLOC. Typically, it's a wash. Uh, what Dre was saying is you have that 1% haircut. 
Um, and this is something called net funding. Um, we can go into more detail if needed, where maybe you know the, those fees are, are cause the warehouse lender to advance less. So there'll be a little bit gap between that. So you'll have that asset, you'll have that liability. Um, we'll go to the next slide, Dre. So in all accounting systems, you have something called a, a chart of accounts. Um, I would, um, based on my experience and, and seeing in balance sheets and income statements, um, you'll have other assets typically, but I would try to be as specific as possible. Um, I would try to, you know, I don't want to, we don't want to be in the business to tell you how to report things, but if there's things that are reported that just seems ambiguous, we'll, we're going to ask questions, even, you know, especially if it's material. Um, so I've seen things as, you know, other AR or tangible assets. Um, and I think that tangible assets are just, that's how they reported their pp and &E. So again, we're not in the business to tell you how to report it, you know, um, well, that's more of a Richie May function, but if we see something that we're not used to seeing, just expect an answer. It can just be a, a typical question. Hey, what does this represent? What are the ma major components of this? Um, look out for high concentrations in specific assets. Uh, that's what we're kind of trained to do. Um, we have some in instances in the past where real estate was, I don't know, maybe 50 or 60 or even as high as 70% of that net worth. Uh, in that specific scenario, I think cash was like really low, so that could be a risk. Um, that actually has changed um, due to HUD's recent changes for their requirements for what's acceptable um, for uh, pp and &E. So we had some mortgage bankers, um, not we, just the industry, some mortgage bankers um, were just throwing properties, boats, and what have you, because you could, you, they were following guidelines, but I believe the new guideline is you, know, you can only include that pp and &E that, that's housing that mortgage operations. Um, Dre spoke a little bit about best practices. Um, typically, like Dre had said, uh, warehouse lenders require quarterly financial statements. I would recommend, even if it's just internally, um, reporting your, your, your production, your revenue, your expenses by month. Um, it's a good it's a good tool. Yeah, it's it's more work, but it's gonna just gonna get you out in front of things, especially in this market to see negative trends and, and positive trends as well. But right now it's a tough market. And the more you view it, um, the more you can see the possibility of of trends. It's kind of like that old phrase fra uh, phrase from uh, Dave Ramsey. Um, are you looking at your cash flows weekly? So the more you look at it, the more opportunity it is to 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 pick up something before something bad happens. Um, so on our next slide, we'll have production for each period um, and we'll break down of uh, more of a best practice. So this was actually um, a partial income statement that um, actually it's a full income statement, but I've recreated it to show from a best practice point of view. It shows month by month, January, February, March, it shows the Q1 total and it shows the year to date. Um, that's pretty, so if I'm a mortgage banker, I can, this is good because I just don't have that Q1 column. I have three separate periods of time where I can see my, my product mixed by period, my revenue streams. So when you're a, a banker now, again, or a lender, right? So typically in a TPO world, you know, who you're saying that loan to is the lender. You are now the lender. Um, there's a new revenue stream, a gain on sale of loans held for sale. Um, there's also a new revenue stream, uh, net interest income. Uh, and that's basically uh, the the use of you using your line. You're accruing interest income, and you're accruing on 100% of the loan, and you're typically uh, accruing interest expense at 99%, which is typically a wash. But that can be a revenue stream as production goes up, uh, and if you are um, um, asking the warehouse lender to advance less than the 99. So you know, like Trey had said, you can you know on a 6% loan, you, you can. Where else can you get 6%? So um, and that's also a good risk mitigant for the warehouse lender advancing less. Um, I always like to tell my customers, if possible, try to differentiate between variable and fixed cost. So cost of goods, so, uh, cost of sales, cost of goods sold, um, they're typically variable costs. I would try to um, break those out so you know, you know, um, what's fixed. Because fixed costs you have to pay regardless. So if volume goes down, you're still paying that. Uh, the goal. In, in this model, the NDC model, non-delegated channel is to 
try to maximize as many costs and make them variable as possible. Um, some items to focus on, budgeting, forecasting, um, retention of earnings. And again, this, this could be scary to some, but it's really not because you can use us as advocates and we can help you uh, along the way. Uh, the warehouse lender is going to want to know, you know, even after the approval, um, the warehouse lender is going to want to know, okay, what is this company going to look like after I approve them? You know, uh, the worst fear is, you know, that somebody's going to take money out, right? And that's hence the reason for 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 quarterly covenants. Um, but we love, we want to, you know, help help us tell your story. Um, is there like a retained earnings um, program that you have? Uh, not program, but what do you? What, is there a certain type of uh, or percentage of retained earnings that you do quarterly? Um, is there any major uh, dividends expecting, you know, what's your dividends policy? And this all falls under something what we call a capital plan. So we'd say, hey, what is your capital plan for the next three to six months? And it's especially important now in this industry, in this time, um, we're asking that on every credit file, hey, uh, what's what's going on that's good? Um, what do you expect three months? And, and down the road or, or in the past, you know, nine months, people say, oh, Jim, I don't have a crystal ball. I'm like, okay, I get it. But in the times where we're now, you know, are you, are you hiring more loan officers? Are you retaining earnings, capital plan, operational plan, all that good stuff? Um, so if you're not doing that already, um, it's not, a, um, I had somebody ask me, do I have to write, uh, write like a six page narrative? I'm like, no, it's it's more of a, let's have a conversation about what you're, you are thinking of the future of your company. Um, this drives increases in warehouse lines. So the, basically the warehouse line is the life force of your business now. Um, is it okay to maintain a strategy of, or have a strategy of being in maintain mode? So my cash, keep the same cash or, or, or same net worth and I'm managing it to the covenants. That's fine, but but I think you may be robbing yourself of a possible, um, well, definitely, you know, you're not thinking about growth. So when you think about growth, you got to think about, okay, increases in subsequent increases in lines. What the White House lenders typically want to see is a proportional increase, you know, just say you're going from two to six, we we'll want to see that proportional increase um, on or about in that net worth as well. So we want to see that the company is growing. Um, Dre, I have here Title II, and I think it's a good segue. Maybe you can comment a little bit about that in regard to growth and what the NDC does um, when they come on from brokering and they want to actually go put their FHA loans on their line. Well, very simply, it's being able to fund FHA loans as a correspondent instead of a broker. Essentially, there is a minimum, you have to have audited net worth of a million dollars just to get started, and it changes as you grow, but it gives you the ability to fund those FHA loans that tend to have more, you know, uh, it gives the customer more flexibility because there's more premium in those loans, um, and an another way that you can continue to grow, kind of a next step. That has changed in the last couple of years, as Jim said, where you used to be able to use properties that were in the business name, automobiles, vehicles, things of that nature. <laughs> it's gotten to where it limits that. It's an example. You can only use the building that the company resides, you know, does business out of versus investment properties, et cetera. But that's really a whole other topic. So moving okay. on. <clears throat> Thank you, Dre. So warehouse lines uh, basically driven by the strength of your balance sheet. There's two ways to build your balance sheet. You have contributed capital and you have earned capital. Contributed capital basically sourced capital from the owner. So Dre and I own a mortgage company and we put in cash, we put in property planning equipment, you know, hopefully more cash than, than PP&E, right? Um, earned capital, I think is a little bit more important. Um, it's more of a long-term strategy. Earned capital is basically you're making money, you're making net income. And at the end of the period, that net income rolls into that balance sheet hence increasing that net worth and that cash. Um, so those are two differences, uh, earned capital, you know, especially if, I mean, if you're a new company in this cash burn, okay, you know, everybody's story is different, which is which is great, you know, especially about our program, we want to hear the story, right? So the story, okay, you know, they contribute capital, his own cash and expects to be profitable in, in five or six months. So that's when the earned capital comes in. Um, so things to start, Thinking about if you're not already is, is monthly break even. Um, simply put, is how many loans do you have to originate and sell um, to make a zero profit, right? So that's kind of like a bench, a good benchmark to start thinking about. Um, 
and it, it kind of forces you to focus on your um, expense management. Um, again, you want to have that low as much as you can, low fixed expenses. You want to, in case volume drops, you want as many expenses to drop with that volume, hence that variable model. Um, key uh, KPIs, um, it's always good to know how much money you make per re revenue per loan, your expense per loan, net income per loan, all that good stuff. And follow these on a monthly basis because again, um, the warehouse lender may not require the monthly, but it's just going to benefit you down the road. Um, we can help with that. Um, Richie May can help advise on that as well. Um, budgeting, there's no perfect way to budget. Our goal here is, um, you know, even if you're if you remain a broker, um, our goal here is to have you start thinking about, you know, what am what am I going to be looking like down the road. This is an example of, uh, we've used in the past where we had Q1, Q2. So it was based on quarterly, uh, we had an actual, and we just budgeted, okay, what do you guys think, you think you're gonna make next quarter and the following quarter? And yeah, sometimes a Q4, three quarters out, it's kind of a, a roll of the dice, right? But we wanna capture, you know, at the very least, that you're your first budgeted period, what do you think you're gonna make? Are there any, any uh, capital contributions, distributions? Um, we're not going to tell you when and where to divot, dividend. I mean, as long as you're meeting your your financial covenants, but you have to consider taxes. Um, are you paying them quarterly? Are you paying them prepaying them? Some states allow you to prepay them, and they, they give you a credit. Um, and that's all going to fall into you know your earnings, your distributions, and contributions. It makes you start thinking about planning for the year ahead or or for that next quarter. So again, that's just to scare you, just a way of um, for the warehouse lender how they think. Um, definitely not to scare you on this one. The big difference on this one is basically the same thing on the top portion, but it's by month. Um, I think you know this is the best way to approach things. Uh, the more visibility you have to your production, to your base, basically E&L components, the better you are, the better you're sitting to see if, if, if something's going to hit the fan, so to speak. Um, and this is kind of cool in a way because it's a tool and I have no problem sharing it. Um, Based on your budget on the top, on the bottom, are you going to meet your 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 warehouse covenants? So it's kind of like a tool, like a what if scenario. Okay, hey, I'm going to have distributions. I'm I'm going to take my family trip and and take out these distributions, pay taxes. Am I going to meet my my warehouse covenants? Um, and I have that little March uh, uh, don't, the, the month of March um, highlighted only because, like Dre had said, that's a reportable period, so to speak. So if you're a calendar year, you know, Q1 is going to, the end of Q1 is going to be March. So one of those things to think about. Um, <clears throat> I've been in warehouse lending probably for, uh, I don't know, 2006, and I probably asked this question 2,500 times. Um, and it's a good, fair question. Um, um, in the past, I had said, hey, make sure you know what, what be cognizant of what, what's going in and going out. Um, with the absence of any fair value changes, we won't see that in, the, in this model. But in this example, you know, 2021 to 2022, um, what can change? You know, net income, net loss, additional paid in capital, dividends, distributions. In this example, um, this would be a, a risk to a warehouse lender. So anytime you have dividends in excess of net income, it's a risk. Is it the end of the world? No. I mean, there's ways to mitigate it. I mean, what's the best cure for that is having additional paid in capital from the owners, right? In uh, this scenario, is a little bit, a little bit, you know, heavier. Um, so there's actually a loss of 500,000, and they still took 352 out. Um, that could very well be paying for last year's tax, taxes, but it it, war it will warrants a phone call or a list of questions or hey, what's going on here? And more importantly, what is this going to look like moving forward? So this is my last slide. I wanted to add something to this presentation and, and what's going on in the current market now. So um, Dre and I, um, we've had a lot of customers that just aren't making money in the quarter or, 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 or monthly, not the end of the world. But these, are, these are the type of questions we'll have to ask when we, when we present this to our committee to ask for a, a waiver of the covenant, right? Um, so, the monthly cash burn rate, if you're not profitable, essentially is how many months do I have to, does the company have to live, right? Assuming that you have that same rate moving forward. Uh, we'll want to know what factors drove the loss. Um, what, did you, what did you do to remedy? Uh, did you have layoffs? Did, did you reduce salary? 
is was there any operational efficiencies, uh, schedule additional paying capitals? Um, I had one customer call all of his vendors and renegotiate with his vendors, which I thought was kind of cool. Uh, when do you expect to be profitable again on a monthly basis, if not already? So we use a, a quick spreadsheet down and dirty. Um, in this scenario, um, the year-to-date loss was 432, um, and their monthly cash burn was 26 months. And basically, it's, it's assuming that the loss, you know, the progression of the loss didn't get any worse or better. It just stayed the same. They would have 26 months of cash to burn. So there's a lot of time there. So you want to be in the safe zone if you want to do a self-calculation on your own P&L right now or at the end of the year. Um, you want to be at least 12 months plus to be kind of like in a safe zone, maybe 12 to 15 months. Um, but again, this is we're seeing a lot of this, and um, that this is the slide that I wanted to end on because I think it's 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 really it gets you thinking. Okay, you know, how much do I have to live? And that's not morbid, but a lot of a lot of folks think they have a strong a strong balance sheet, but they don't realize the propensity of the loss. And if they continue at that rate, um, we had somebody the other day where it was five or six months, and it's a hard conversation to have. But you need to have that conversation. And warehouse lender can help with that, right? I mean, you're have the ultimate responsibility of getting that back up and running. But um, we're here to we're here to advise. So thank you guys. And with that, poll question number three. Kim, I'm gonna pass off control to you. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks guys. Very helpful information. So uh, now that they've given their perspective from the warehouse banker's view, uh, I was gonna go through some key accounting concepts that are important for business owners to understand uh, whether or not you have an accounting background. I think you know some of these concepts are things that, that you should know and, and make sure that you understand um, kind of taking it a step further from some of the, the concepts that Jim was presenting. Um, so we're actually going to start uh, the, the accounting presentation with a poll question as well. I don't know if the last poll question is finished. There we go. And that question is, do you have someone on your staff who does accounting? Yes or no? Um, we see all kinds of things. Uh, essentially, we get a lot of clients who, you know, they've just started a business. They have no one in accounting, and that's where we can help. Um, even if you do have someone, a CFO or a controller, um, they may not have mortgage accounting experience. So we can also help just train them, kind of go through the policies and procedures and the proper accounting for uh, that mortgage accounting, which is a little more complex. Uh, looks like, yeah, great. A lot of people do have uh, someone on the accounting, uh, someone on the staff that does accounting. So very critical skill uh, to have on your team. Let's see. I don't know, Dre. I can't seem to control the slides. I'll try this again. Try it now. Still nothing. Uh, I don't know. Here we go. I don't know, Dre, if you just want to advance the slides and I'll, I'll tell you when. All right. You can go ahead to the next slide, Dre. Okay, so how is mortgage accounting different? Well, mortgage process is complex. So as you can imagine, the accounting for that mortgage process is also complex. I mean, I think the key variable here is if you know anything about accounting, you know, a lot of times 
the entries that you're putting into your general ledger system are, are pretty high level and all the supporting detail is kind of kept in another system um, or in the background in Excel files. You know, the key thing with mortgage accounting is you really need to have uh, diligent tracking and reconciliation at the individual loan level. So, you know, you're going to have things that you have to track like escrow liabilities, um, warehouse bank activity that Jim and Dre just talked at length about, um, income, meaning origination income and, and gain on sale. And then you're going to have all these interest and fees to track. So it's important to make sure you have a good um, a good list or accounting of what what's the loan level impact of all of these things. Um, for purposes of reconciliation, it makes it a lot easier. Um, also, you just need to know the, the financial um, reporting requirements, which Jim and Dre got into as well. So in terms of getting started, what I would say first and foremost is to leverage experts as early on as in the process as you can. Um, from an accounting perspective, getting those procedures and financial reporting in place, um, having a compliance expert help you with agency approvals, regulations, and then from a legal standpoint, uh, it's really important to get those organizational documents. So seek tax advice and legal advice um, as soon as possible on how best to set up your organization, whether that's an LLC, an S Corp or a C Corp. Um, there's a lot of tax implications to those things. Um, so make sure you're consulting experts on the best way to set up your business um, and have all of those legal documentation, all those legal documents drafted up before you start to open bank accounts and things of that nature. Um, some agencies require you to have an open balance, opening balance sheet audit uh, to, to achieve some of those approvals and, and those organizational documents are something that they'll be asking for. Um, one of the most important things really is systems. So systems are critical. I think Jim touched on a couple of the accounting systems. You know, given the audience on this call today, I'm sure you all know what a loan origination system is and won't have much trouble really selecting that system. But um, the accounting system, you know, there's really two systems that we see most often that are geared toward and built for loan level accounting um, and can handle all of that loan level detail within the general ledger system itself. Those are loan vision and accounting for mortgage bankers, which Jim mentioned before, A and B for short. Uh, we also see, you know, a lot of startups honestly are still on QuickBooks and QuickBooks is fine when you're getting started. Um, you know, you can do some things like customizations and things to help um, with the loan level details within QuickBooks. But once you start getting uh, to a certain point, it's time to graduate from, from QuickBooks. We've also seen, you know, quite a few clients have started to see an interest in NetSuite as a possible system. So NetSuite, you know, if you know anything about that system, it wasn't built specifically for loan level accounting, but it's a highly versatile system, very configurable. And uh, what's nice about it is, is you can have an endless amount of add-on um, options for other things like accounts payable automation and those types of things. So that one is kind of growing in popularity here lately. Um, you know, one thing I will say about the system implementation, you know, operational involvement is absolutely critical um, and necessary to make sure that your financials are useful um, and that your financial reporting gives you the data that you want. Um, implementation, implementation of these LOS systems and, and accounting systems, it does require close collaboration uh, and planning between your all of your operational departments and your accountants. Um, ultimately, in the LOS, you want to make sure uh, that you're developing key fields to capture the data you want and make them uh, foolproof. Don't make them open-ended text fields. Uh, make them, you know, drop downs and those types of things. So beginning with the end in mind it is really important. You can't report on data if it doesn't exist. So make sure you're getting that data um, accurately and consistency, consistently loaded into your LOS system. So really quickly on the accounting concept. So best practice in terms of how best to account for and reconcile these loan level entries. Um, you know, on the left-hand side, you've got your loan origination system. This is where all of your data is coming from, the source, if you will. And you're gonna have funded loans and sold loans coming from your origi loan origination system that need to be imported, um, best practice at least, imported into your general ledger system. We recommend importing those types of transactions, at least the, the net amount that you expect to go between um, you as a lender and your warehouse bank. 
put all of that activity into either a funded clearing or a purchase clearing GL account. Then on the flip side, when you get your data reporting from your warehouse bank on all the detailed transactions that have gone through the warehouse, load the details of those by loan into those same funding and purchase clearing accounts. So what that's gonna do is isolate all of that activity into clearing accounts. At the end of the month or even more frequently, um, you're gonna look at those clearing accounts and if there's a balance, that tells you something's wrong. Uh, something didn't come through as you would expect, and that's where you really focus your attention during the reconciliation process to clear up any of those variances. So the next slide, I think, you know, Jim touched on some of these too. You know, I'm not going to get into the details of debits and credits. I don't want to bore everyone. But um, for the loan funding entries and the loan sale entries, I mean, basic concepts here. When you fund a loan, you're going to add a loan held for sale as an asset to your balance sheet. You're also gonna offset that, as Jim mentioned, with the warehouse uh, line of credit borrowing, which will be a liability. Um, the borrower escrows, uh, this is something that's very important. You know, though that cash must match your liability. Um, and, you know, when you put those in there, you have to be very cognizant of what's going in those escrow liabilities. Um, then you're gonna have origination fees, pass-through costs, interest and in, in MIP payables, liabilities, all those various things that might differ depending on your business, but key components of loan funding. On the flip side, um, on the loan sales side, uh, one of the key things here, you know, and this all goes back to um, the systems and how critical it is to get your loan origination set up, loan origination system set up um, with the end goal in mind. Um, so for loan sales, you know, one of the key things here is that sale data is going to be coming into your, your general ledger system from purchase advice information that someone on your team is entering into the LOS. So again, make sure that person is trained on the proper way to enter that purchase advice information um, so that it's getting ultimately into your financial reporting in the right way. Um, but in general, loan sale, you're going to remove that loan held for sale asset from your balance sheet, remove that warehouse lending, um, warehouse borrowing liability. The borrower escrows should now be transferred. Um, and then you're gonna have interest in income from the first of the month to the purchase date, and then gain on sale, investor fees, warehouse interest and expenses, and all of those types of things. Um, the next slide, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on. Um, you know, I think ultimately a couple of key considerations on in dealing with first payments. So you know, of utmost importance is to get those loans sold as soon as possible. Um, if you don't, you might have to deal with these first payments. So just, you know, of note, be very diligent in collecting those amounts due and remitting those payments to the proper authorities. It also could trigger some 1098 requirements, um, some requirements for write-offs and loan loss reserves if, if you're not collecting those and those types of things. On the next slide, uh, I think, you know, most of you that are accountants, this goes without saying, but reconciliation is one of the most important things you can do. I can definitely share some horror stories in terms of, you know, companies that thought reconciliation wasn't that important. Um, so, you know, and it, it turns out to be a huge cleanup project, it can be a very expensive endeavor to, to hire uh, people to help you get everything cleaned up and on the right track. So, you know, I think the most important thing I'll mention on this slide is really around those escrow funds and those liability accounts. Um, an important thing you should do and look at when you're reconciling is, you know, if you have escrow liabilities outstanding and you look at your loans held for sale and, and the loan for that escrow is no longer on your books if you've already sold it, then the, the escrow liability shouldn't be there either. So make sure you're, you're looking into that and, and investigating those variances as soon as possible. Um, this is an account we see all the time, you know, can get very backlogged with old balances and then it again becomes a massive cleanup project. And then on financial reporting, you know, I think Jim touched on this pretty well, so I'm not going to go into any more details on this. Um, just know the requirements. Uh, the key thing really here is, is cash basis of accounting isn't going to cut it anymore, which is what you may be used to. Um, and there are going to be some differences between the income you're expecting or the income um, and expenses that you're used to seeing on cash basis versus gap accounting, uh, which is more accrual and prepaid based. 
So just expect those differences and, and kind of work with your team to understand what those might be. Um, also just note that you'll have those quarterly call reports that you're required to file. If you have agency approvals, um, you'll have 1098s and 1099 filings that you need to think about as well. So, you know, on top of financial reporting, you know, I think there's several things that um, you know go along with it. It's not just generating your balance sheet and income statement at the end of the month. Um, and Dre did touch uh, a lot on, I'm sorry, Jim touched a lot on budgeting, uh, assessing that revenue, looking at your data, making sure you're staying on top of it. Um, and you know look at things on a granular level. Um, on a branch level, by loan type, those types of things are all very important as well as making sure you're staying on top of your cash flow forecast and um, your budgeting there. So next, you know, trend analysis is also very important. It, it helps you inform your budget, um, make sure you're understanding what trends are happening in the marketplace and also within your own business. Um, things like production mix, net production income, and cost to originate. We've got a slide on each one of those. So we have uh, Richie May Select, which is an offering by Richie May that uh, is a benchmarking platform. We take information from about 90 different IMBs and we compile you know, some trend analysis data there um, that gets published. Um, and, and there's a mortgage trend series that's offered every quarter where you can stay up to date on what those trends are looking like. Um, if you flip to the next slide, Dre, um, production mix. You know, here the blue bar represents purchase volume and the green bar is refi volume. So as expected, you know, production's been dropping the last seven consecutive quarters, starting to dry up. Uh, refi refis are starting to dry up. And in Q3, they made up only 11% of um, the production mix, while purchases were 89%. Um, and looking at the peak volume from Q4 of 2020, uh, production's down almost 50%. So, you know, one thing, you know, kind of if there is a highlight uh, on this slide at all, it's that, you know, volume's dropping, but still, you know, it is higher than pre-COVID -pre levels to some degree. So it looks like things are maybe just starting to normalize. On the net production income, um, you know, again, we're, we're seeing negative net production income, you know, pretty rare, only six quarters in history. Um, so this this one looks pretty abysmal. Uh, cost to originate on the next slide. Um, you know, essentially, make sure you're understanding what your cost to originate looks like, and break it down into even more components um, than these. Uh, it's really helpful for you to kind of understand what's going on inside your business. And then the final slide is on uh, variance analysis and benchmark benchmarking. Essentially, you know, the key message here is. Make sure you're you're looking at those budgets, your forecasts. Do the variance analysis. Figure out where you're where you're going astray. Um, if you get to the second month of the year and you realize, hey, you know, my budget I can throw out the window because everything's changed. Well, then don't call it a budget. Maybe just call it a, a rolling forecast. Keep maintaining it. Keep updating it. Make it flexible so that you can constantly update those inputs um, and keep updating it and keep tracking yourself. Um, it's, it's going to help you improve your business in the long run. And with that, you know, the last slide is just, you know, how can Richie May help? We do offer client accounting and advisory services. Um, that comes from, you know, includes anything from outsourced accounting and staff augmentation all the way up through consulting. We do help people with accounting system implementations and special projects. And then in terms of um, other advisory services, business intelligence and automation, um, you can read them there. You know, Richie May offers a lot of great, valuable advisory services. So definitely give us a call and, and let us know how we can help. So we we were supposed to have time uh, for some questions, but it looks like it's it's 2:59. So you know, if you do have additional questions, you know, all of our contact information is in the slides. So absolutely, feel free to reach out. We'd be happy to help you and, and kind of guide and counsel you in in the ways you should go, if you will. Dre, Jim, any final thoughts? Absolutely. Absolutely. We'd, all, we'd like to thank you guys for joining, uh, taking the time out of your days. I know everybody's busy. We'd like to thank Richie May for hosting this for us. And um, please feel free to reach out to either Kim or any of our team here. I'm going to get to 
there we were. Get any of our team, if you have any questions or, or anything, all the contact information is in the slides. Thank you all again. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Have a great day.